Hello, everybody, and happy Thursday. We're here to have a wonderful collaboration with a bunch of guests today. I, I see that some people have read my Wikipedia page, apparently. If you have never been to this live stream before, what I want to welcome you to is we're going to spend an hour talking about some math. It's actually going to be a huge surprise for everybody, including me, because I've never actually looked at these problems before. And what we're doing today is we're actually doing a fun collaboration with the Montgomery Blair Mathematics Tournament. And this is a competition which is organized by students at Mo Montgomery Blair High School. And normally it's an in-person competition where they normally have people who, you know, will go to a place and have some fun doing math. Of course, due to obvious reasons, we're not doing anything in person nowadays. So instead they run it online. And so what we do usually in this hour is usually people ask me random math questions that are supposed to be understandable to people who are studying algebra or geometry. Now, Today, instead, what we're doing is we're going to talk about some questions which are from their competition. If you have been here before, I can sort of tell based on the chat, it seems. OK, well, welcome back to all of you who are here before. Let's have some fun doing some problems. And thank you for all of the wishes, too. Uh, you're making me feel old. All right, question number 15, apparently. This is number 15. Bread draws a circle. Bread? Who calls their kid bread? Well, someone with a sense of humor. Bread draws a circle. He then selects four random distinct points on the circumference of the circle to form a convex quadrilateral. Ku comes by and randomly chooses another three distinct points. Okay, whenever I read a question, I actually have to kind of sketch out what's going on because I'm not really sure what the problem means yet. So here's a circle, all right? I'm bread. Bread. I drew a circle, okay? That is an awful circle. That looks like a lump. Let's try again. A little bit more legit, OK? So a little bit more legit. So let's use this circle. And then there are four random distinct points on the circumference of the circle. So bread chooses four points. You know, here are four random distinct points. And then Ku comes by and randomly chooses another three distinct points. OK, none of those are the same as the other ones. And Kwu gets three points, you know, like this. I don't know. Here, three. Suppose that happens. And the question that we're trying to find is, find the probability that Kwu's triangle does not intersect Brad's quadrilateral. Oh, we're drawing some triangle and some quadrilateral here. It's like this. Wait, Brad was green. See? When I did this, then they didn't intersect. So it seems OK. Oh my goodness. But how in the world can I do this? I'm supposed to find the probability that the triangle and the quadrilateral don't intersect. But you know how many, how many different ways I could do the triangle? How many different ways I could make the, the quadrilateral? How would I even think about this? Because it's like if I put the quadrilateral down first, then I have to say I only stay outside the quadrilateral if I'm all in this part? But how do I even know how big this part is? Yes, and people seem to be talking about how green bread is moldy bread. But you see, there's a good way to do this. So uh, yeah, I see that some people here in this chat already have an idea, and it's an idea I'm thinking of, label the points. You see, there's something interesting that happens here, right? So what's really going on is that seven points are being chosen. So what you think, what you, what you can think about is that somehow bread picks four points, and then Kwu picks three points. And you know, you could say, let's just go like pick four points, pick three points, hope that they don't intersect. Or you could say, what if you first picked seven points? So you had a new person. I got to have a new person. Look, if we've got crazy names like Bread and Kwu, how do I top that? I need, to have a, I need to have an even better name. Hmm. Ah, Mold. Mold. You could instead have Mold pick seven points. All right? So now, you know, you, you ask, like, what kind of thing? Uh, oh, yeah, you guys are right. I should have called it Banana. Actually, to keep in the theme of what's going on here, obviously, Banana. And Banana is pink. Kwu is 
who is yellow, who knows, okay? So banana picks seven points. So here's another way to imagine the whole thing, all right? So forget about bread, forget about ku. Banana shows up first and <laughs> chooses seven points, okay? So seven points get picked. And after banana chooses seven points, banana divvies up. Well, no, the bread just chooses four of them. Okay, so the new rule is, no, 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 bread doesn't get to choose any four points, Ku doesn't get to choose any three points. Banana shows up, chooses seven points, and then tells bread, hey, you, you get four of these. Does this make sense? So the way this is working now is that banana will show up and drop seven points on the circle. And bread gets to choose four of them to be breads. And Ku gets to choose three of them to be Ku's. Now we're talking about a probability, right? So what's, what, we're, what we've just turned the problem into is a much simpler problem. First, banana picks seven points. And it's not even that banana picks seven points at random. I, well, actually, you could say that. Banana picks seven points at random. You could say that. But all the probabilities from now on will actually be the same. So here we go. I need to have a circle. sort of like a circle. Banana picks seven points. I'm going to make them all kind of like open circles. How do you count? One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, counting is hard, by the way. All right, so I've got seven points. These are seven points, all right? Got seven points. Now what's going to happen is after these are all down, I just want to know how many ways can bread and ku divvy these up? And how many of those divvy ups have that the two shapes don't intersect? Right? So remember what's going to happen. Bread is green. Bread picks four of them. And Ku... Ku doesn't really get to pick. Ku gets the other three. Okay? And what I'm interested in is like, look, number one, how many ways can this be done? I need to figure out a probability. Probability that, how do they get to be non-intersecting? It's that all of the green points are like next to each other, and all of the yellow points are next to the others, right? I just care about the probability that it's somehow like all greens next to each other. Greens next to each other. And yellows, too. That's going to be the answer. Maybe some of you can help me figure out this answer now. Because what's the denominator? How many ways can I take these seven points here and divvy up the seven points so that four of them go to green and three of them go to yellow? That's going to be a choose, right? That's going to be seven choose Let's call it seven choose three, choosing the three yellows. Did that make sense to people? Because I basically have here, you know, seven things. I need to choose three of them to be the yellows, and then the others will be the, bre will be the red, uh, green ones. Or I could say pick four of them, but by the way, seven choose four is the same as seven choose three. The way, number of ways to choose four greens is the same as the number of ways to decide that the rest of them are all yellow. And seven choose three, we could figure out. Uh, seven choose three, uh, in this particular... Uh, Today's show, I don't have enough time to prove all of these things. Uh, that's what we actually do in our online course instead. But 7 choose 3 is equal to 7 times 6 times 5 over 3 times 2 times 1. That's 7 choose 3. And what's the numerator? You know, we'll figure this out in a second. But what's the numerator? Oh, I see people already said. The answer here is 35. We could see that it's 35. You cancel these and this, okay? But what's the numerator? How many ways are there to pick all four of the greens next to each other. Yes, that's right, Dylan S. There are seven ways, because how do you pick the greens next to each other? Well, here's one way, one, two, three, four, and the yellows next to each other is the other ones, right? And then you could imagine that you played, oh, I don't know what the game would be called. It's not, it's not really called musical chairs. Musical chairs, there isn't enough, you know, there aren't enough chairs. There is music, and there's too many people. Actually, sorry, to me, musical chairs is just in my head as it's just called the pigeonhole principle. But anyway, there's, there's seven ways because you can decide like where this, this strip of four greens starts. It could start here, like what you see here, or it could start here and then go, 
or it could start here and then go. There's seven starting points, right? So there's seven starting points. So in that case, if I write seven here and I, and I then divide and cancel, it looks to me like I'm going to get an answer of one-fifth. So I'm going to make a, a guess for my answer for this question. Is it one-fifth? Let me ask my assistant, who happens to be here. And it's correct, and we're good. Okay. So this question wasn't so bad. Uh, maybe just to, <laughs> uh, just to think about how did we do this problem, the main reason why this problem looks hard is because you've got like too much random stuff happening at the same time, and if you try to do it in a way where you say, let me just put the green thing down first, and then try to find the probability that the yellow thing doesn't intersect, it's really hard because it depends on how much space there is in each of these pieces. But instead, what you do with this kind of a question is you go and say, let's just have a banana come and help and just choose the seven points first. And these are th this, this method, people say, reminds them of an IMO problem. And it's, it's an idea that's also used in combinatorics quite a lot. All right, let's see what the next question is that they've given me. I did promise to people <laughs> yesterday, um, after we talked about calculus by accident, I promised to people that today would be easier. So I asked my moderation team to please choose some questions to talk about today from the Montgomery Blair Math Tournament that would be interesting and also that could be understandable to lots of people. Let's see what they chose. Oh, a geometry problem. I better drink some water. Hmm. There are mysterious lines on this problem as well. I think what happened with these lines is I bet these lines are supposed to be lines over, um, like over those. So let's just ignore these lines right now. I think that they just go over there. OK. What's this? In a regular hexagon, A, B, C, D, E, F, yes, that's a regular hexagon, uh, of side length 8. Oh, thank you. It says 8. I like that. And center K, that looks like a center, points W and U are chosen on AB, that's a side, and CD, that's also a side, such that KW is 7, yep, that's 7, and angle WKU, this one, is 120 degrees. Looks right also. Find the area of pentagon W, B, C, U, K. Hmm. Now this looks interesting. Okay, so there's a little bit of me which is saying, you know, it looks like a symmetry problem here. This is question 19. There's a bit of me which is scared that maybe I'll be guessing wrong. I'm not going to say this is my final answer yet because I want to go and prove it before I'm sure. But whenever I see 120 degrees, I say it's like a third, okay? And I'm not sure I'm right. In fact, I'm just going to try to draw what happens if I did this too. It awfully looks like each of these is a third. Like somehow it looks like each is the same. But how would I prove this? That's actually an important point, right? In, a, in order to actually know that something like this is true, I would need to have a proof. So I'm going to try to use some geometry called congruence, right? I want to show that this pentagon is what's called congruent to this pentagon, where I just turn it. So if I want to do that, the first thing to do is to double check. All right, if that is a seven, what's that? Do I have a reason to believe that that's also 7? Well, here's something that I could do. I can use a method called angle chasing. Okay, So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start to kind of cut apart these angles. If that's 120 degrees, what's this? See what I'm doing here? I'm drawing just a few more lines just because they could be useful. All right, And I see where this is going. If that's 120 degrees all together, I'll tell you that this part is 60, right? So if that part is 60, I don't know what this angle is. In fact, I don't want to know. This angle here is probably some terrible, terrible number. Let's just call that A. Now, if that happens to be A, can anyone tell me what is the angle here? I'm going to use another green. That is a very ugly arrow. Can anyone tell me in terms of A? Thank you very much. I see a lot of people saying it is 60 minus A. 
Why is it 60 minus a? It's 60 minus a because this thing is also 60. Hey, it fits. My, my fingers sort of fit, right? That's also 60 because this is an equilateral triangle, right? So if I've got an equilateral triangle, then if that guy was a, then this guy is 60 minus a. That makes sense? Now, can anyone tell me what this one is? I'm going to mark another green one. What's this green one? Hmm. So how would I get this green one? What information do I have? The information I have is 120 degrees going all the way out to here. So somehow between here and here it's 120, but 60 of it is eaten up by this middle piece. So there's 60 left. And here's an A. And so this is 60 minus A also. Did that make sense to people? I have a 120. Let's pretend that was 120. It's very hard to make your fingers open to a 120 degree angle. Please do not try that at home. I am not responsible for any medical bills due to broken uh, thumbs. So please do not do that. All right. But so if I could, if I could make a 120 degree angle, you know, you would do that. Ah. I actually can make it look like a 120 degree angle using 3D geometry because of the, the depth of the camera. So anyway, right, I'm just having some fun. I'm like, you know, that's actually, I'm making a 90 degree angle here. But if I do this, from your perspective, it looks like a bigger angle because I'm using the 3D, yes, 3D geometrical pro uh, projection. Okay, sorry, I, 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 I nerd out over stuff like that. But anyway, so, so, so imagine that this thing here was 120 degrees, and if I have 120 degrees minus the 60, so I've got 60 left, minus an A, I have 60 minus A. You broke your thumbs, how did you type that? It's actually really hard. Well, actually, it's not that hard to type without your thumbs. But sometimes I try typing with just one hand. Uh, I, I challenge you, a pretty good challenge is to try to type with just one hand, uh, where you, like, you, know, you, you put your hand here and you try to type properly. It's crazy. Anyway, so this is 60 minus A. Jokes aside, now we're making a lot of progress. Because if that's 60 minus A and that's 60 minus A, now I'm going to say that this triangle here, this little guy, CKU, is actually congruent to the triangle AKW. And the reason why these two are congruent is because they match on an angle. Okay, they match on 60 minus A. Oh, they match on another angle too. This angle is also 60. No, it's not. It's the other one. This one's 60. And this one's 60. And you know what else they match on? When you match on two angles and also match on one side, right? If you match on two angles and also on one side, then you're congruent. And what's the side they match on? This side. This is 8. This side is 8, and this side is 8. So I just found out that these two triangles are congruent. And the way you usually write this is you usually write something like triangle, that's an ugly triangle, triangle CKU is congruent to triangle AKW, right? Because what I just found out is I found there's two angles that match correspondingly and one side that does. I see that people are saying typing with one hand is actually pretty easy. I forgot to add one more detail. Um, actually, the keyboard that I use to type on has no letters on it either. So the, the real challenge is to type with one hand while you're eating a sandwich with the other hand on a keyboard that has no letters displayed so that you actually can't see any of the letters. Um, that's actually a challenge. So that's, that's actually what I, what I happen to have, um, that, that, that I happen to do sometimes, eating a sandwich with one hand while typing on the other hand and being like, oh, wow, um, I, I, for some reason my, my keyboard has no letters written on it. Where's that U again? Is it that one or is it that one? Anyway, right, let's keep going on. So if we've got this thing, we've got these two triangles are congruent. From that, I got a very important point. I now know that the other sides are the same. So if that was seven, this one's also seven. Boom. So now I got a lot of useful information. I've now found out that that's 7 and that's 7. And other things that are also useful, this little angle here is that little angle there. I'm not going to give it a name. I'll just mark it like this. These are the same. OK? So what we're, ju what we're doing now is we're basically setting up to show that this pentagon here is actually congruent to this pentagon here. And in fact, since that was a 120 degree rotation, and then that became 7 and that became 7, what that means is that this is also 7, because it's still, this is another 120 degrees. So by symmetry, or by basically repeating the argument again, that would be 7, and I'd also get another, that angle is congruent to that angle. And at this stage, what we have found out is that like this picture here and this picture here, they match on this angle. 
They match on the 120 degrees. They match on every angle. They also match on every length. Like these lengths match with those lengths. Um, if I wanted to, I could go and show that that length there is also matching with this, again, using the congruent triangles, right? Um, this is also eight. And all of this thing can be shown to match, OK? So, so I'm talking about that a bit fast, because the main hard part just got done. Ah, I see that somebody asked, did you just use ah congruency? No, you don't. There's no such thing as ah congruency. Because actually, if you have all the angles match, let me show you something which is a pair of quadrilaterals with ah congruency. Here is why a a a a is equal to, um, I mean, yeah, it's like ah. That's right. This is what a a a a is. It's, it's useless. It's useless. And it doesn't even give you similarity, right? It's because here's an example of you know a shape, a shape which is. All is, I'm going to have two shapes, two shapes. Okay, here's one shape, and here's another shape. Guess what? They are, ah, because they're all 90, right? Like somehow every angle matches, right? Somehow it's 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90. It's like as, as matched as you could get, but they are not even similar, N not to mention congruent, right? They're not even similar because one is a rectangle and one is a well, sorry, one is a square and one is a non-square rectangle. So what's going on here is not even similar. If you have triangles with AAA, then you have similarity. But once you have more than three sides, all bets are off. So actually what I was using is I was actually getting congruence between this one and the other one. The congruence that I was getting uh, yeah, let, let's give this a name. If that's W and that's U, so W, U, what order is this? V, it better be V. The letter that's missing must be V. Okay, so we're going to call it V. So because I was like, what, what, letter is, uh, what letter do you do next if you had W and then U, right? Has to be V. So we got this V. And so what, we, what, what, I, what I was actually doing is I wasn't using a, 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 a similarity or congruence. I was actually using uh, S, a, S, A, S, A, S, A, is that enough? S, A, congruence. So I was using sa, 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 congruence. And what, 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 what I mean is that somehow all of the sides matched and all of the angles matched. And if that's the case, of course they're congruent. Because in this particular piece, I actually have that all the sides correspondingly match, all the angles correspondingly match, boom, that would be good enough. And technically speaking, you could actually get rid of the last A if you wanted to, but whatever, we got them all. OK, now, what do we do next? We need to actually solve the problem. I just got excited showing that these are all one third. The last part of the problem is to read the problem and remember what we were supposed to do. Oh, we were supposed to find one third of the area of the whole hexagon. Let's do it. So what's the area of the whole hexagon? This is now the easy part. Uh, I want to see if I've got a blank screen. I do. So if I have a, if I have a hexagon, um, well, it's basically made of six equilateral triangles, right? So the area of the hexagon, I want one third of that, remember, is equal to six times the area of this thing, which is eight. Well, let's just draw the thing big. Six times the area of, I always do it like this, Cut down the middle, 8, 4, 4 root 3. OK? And once you look at something like this, it's half base times height. Half of the base is conveniently 4. 4 times the height is 16 root 3. So the area of the entire hexagon is 6 times 16 root 3. But the reason I didn't multiply the 6 in yet is because I actually care about 1 third of that. So if I want 1 third of that, what's 1 third of this? Take a third of the 6 first. So now the answer is equal to one third of that, which is 2 times 16 root 3. And so I'm going to guess that the answer is 32 root 3. And let me ask my assistant, how are we doing? And it's good. So it worked. OK. Now you might say, you might say, why did we waste so much time proving something? You know, it looked like it was one third. And indeed, if you're doing a math contest, you can go ahead and say it looks like one third, and you can kind of just, you know, 
say that that's my answer. But it's much better to kind of know for sure. And whenever you have something like this, it works in the hexagon because it's a hexagon. If you actually had this thing as an octagon and you took 120 degrees, it probably wouldn't be right. What's going on is that it actually was that I took this 120, and when I did this turn, remember I cut out a 60, and so something worked very well because it happened to be a hexagon. Okay, let's see. Ah, somebody is asking who my assistant is. Is it myself? No, it's not myself, because I have never done these problems before, and I don't happen to know the answers. Let's see, what else do we have? Oh, some people say they don't get this. Okay, hmm. Here's what I'll say. If you don't get this, the main thing we did is we showed that, you see, I wanted to know the area of this piece. And when I drew that, it suspiciously looked like this was exactly one third of the whole thing. And then we went and proved that. Okay, we proved why it was one third of the whole. We proved why all three pieces were the same, that you turn it and it's the same. And then the game became, what's one third of the area of the whole hexagon? And if you want to know what is one third of the area of the whole hexagon, you just do it. Because the hexagon is made of six triangles, six equilateral triangles, each one of which you can do. And by the way, if you want to know how to do this kind of a thing, this is using something called 30, 60, 90 right triangles, uh, which is, you know, they're, they're one of the most standard things that you'll come into. And also this is the proof of why it works, because if this is an eight all the way across and you chopped it in half, of course it's four. And you could get this guy using what's called the Pythagorean theorem. If you have the eight and you have the four, you can get the four root three. All right. I see that we might have some more time left. I wonder if my team gave me another problem. Hmm. Oh, what's this? Okay. Let's see, let's see. Oh, meanwhile, let me go ahead and ask, answer some questions that have come in. All right, I saw there were some questions that came in. Uh, somebody asked, uh, Anif, uh, yeah, so uh, Anvith, Anvith, Anvith Kakera asked, do you know Richard Russick? Of course. I mean, we do the same kind of stuff. So in the world, whenever there's a bunch of people who are doing the same kind of um, same kind of things to help people, they generally know each other. And also, in the case of mathematics, we also usually happen to be friends. And there was another question. Fru de Games asked, Po Shen Lo, have you gotten something wrong before on a YouTube live stream? Oh, yeah, I get things wrong all the time. Um, anyone who watches this live stream knows that I just c incessantly make mistakes where I'm always like, yeah, you know, let's go and multiply 7 times 5, and the answer is 70. Oops. Right? So th that, that actually happens all the time. Um, but what happens is after I make the mistakes, everyone on the chat starts calling me out and being like, hey, 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 you know, oops, how about fix this, how about fix that? And then all together, this whole group manages to solve the problems. That's what makes me dare to go and take these crazy hard problems here and put them here, because if I get them wrong, someone's going to help me fix it. All right, now, let's, uh, we'll, we'll do more of these questions that came from the crowd in a little bit. I always try to save enough time for that. And let's go ahead and try this number 20. Sam, that's a normal name. What happened to bread? I kind of liked bread. Anyway, Sam colors each tile in a 4x4 four four grid, white or black. A coloring is called rotationally symmetric if the grid can be rotated 90 degrees, 180 degrees, or 270 degrees to achieve the same pattern. I'll, I'll buy that. It seems reasonable. Two colorings are called rotationally distinct if neither can be rotated to match the other. Makes sense. How many rotationally distinct ways are there for Sam to color the grid such that the colorings are not rotationally symmetric? Oh, these are interesting. Okay. So what we have to do here is we basically will have to go and say some kinds of colorings appear too many times. Ooh, let me take a step back. Let me first say, hey, 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 here's the wrong answer. The answer is not 2 to the power 16. But by the way, what is 2 to the power 16? See, 2 to the power 16 would be if I just said, see that one? It's either white or black. That one? It's either white or black. Two choices. So I've got two choices for that color, times two choices for that color, times two choices for that color, and do it, and do it, and do it. And you, you times by two, and you times together 16 twos. So that would be the answer if I didn't have to worry about this rotationally symmetric. But now what I need to do is I need to say, you know, sometimes there's this rotational symmetry. So sometimes some of these colorings happen to overlap with each other. Now, what's the easiest way to do this? You said rotated 90 degrees, 180, or 270 to achieve the same pattern. 
But you know, if I rotate it 90 degrees and I get the same pattern, if I then, I then I can rotate it 90 more degrees and get the same pattern, and I can rotate it 90 more and I'll get the same. And if I keep rotating, I break my wrist. Please do not try this at home. As mentioned before, I am not responsible for medical injuries that may result from watching this live stream. But now, uh, right, right now what we have here is that we're saying that if you rotate, 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 hey look, the 90 and the 270 are the same kind. Oh no, you just broke your hand? Please do not do that. How would you type that then? Anyway, so, so like that somehow the 90 degrees and the 270 degrees, like the ones that can be rotated 90 to get the same thing, are the same as the ones that can be rotated 270 to get the same thing. What I'm saying is that there's like two kinds. There's three kinds. There's three kinds of colorings. One kind of colorings is you rotate 90 degrees, and it's different. Rotate 180, it's different. In fact, all four rotations are different. So what I'm going to say is there's, there's three kinds, okay? three kinds of colorings. Number one, all four rotations different. Because there are really four rotations to play with, all right? Four rotations are different. If you want to know one example of this, here I'll show you this one, I'm really lazy. As anyone who has watched this live stream knows, I'm extremely lazy. So it's like, if I just did that and just colored one square, all four of the rotations will be different, obviously, because that square is just going to bounce around uh, to the different locations, okay? That's one way. But there's another way. Another way is that there are two, like somehow there's like, as you do these four rotations, there are two different things that appear among the four rotations. And I'll give you an example. If I just did this. If I just did this and I think about the rotations, one rotation, uh, my little white squares go here and here. The next rotation is like, here we go, we're back again. And then we do one more rotation, it's like, oh, you know, we just got back that one. And then the last, well, there's no no last one. The first one is you stay put. The second one is the white squares go there and there. The third one is, hey, we saw it before. The fourth one is, oh, we also saw that one before. Okay? So what I'm saying is the second kind is of the four rotations, you basically have that it's like they alternate. Does that make sense? It's like they're alternately different. I don't know if that makes sense to you. Alternately different is supposed to be that, hey, it's this, and then, oh, it's something new, and it's like, just kidding, you're back, and oh yeah, we're back to there again. So it's like somehow alternately different. Did that make sense? And by the way, I've got a, I've got a third kind. Can anyone tell me what the third kind is? Maybe you can see where I'm going with this. One kind is, one kind of coloring is that all four are different. All four of rotations are different. The second one is, oh, there's two different ones. And there's one more, all are same. Thank you very much. The third one is, running into my logo almost, of four rotations, all are the same. And if I wanted to show you what that looks like here, I'd just do this. All right. But these are the three kinds. These are the three kinds. And now here's what I intend to do. I intend to say that if I could find out how many of each of those kinds there are, that will have something to do with my 2 to the 16. Does that make sense? I basically am going to say that, and, and, and oh, no, no, actually, let me take that back. How many of these have all four rotations different? I don't know. There's a bunch of these pictures. See, I just showed you one. Um, uh, actually, that, that one's this one, all the same. And there's some in here and some in here. But my claim is that among all three of these categories, the total number in each of those categories is going to be 2 to the 16. So although the answer is not 2 to the power 16, the answer, uh, see again, these are the three kinds that I broke the 2 to the 16 into. The number of ways to do the things in 1 plus the number of ways to do the things in 2 plus the number of ways to do the things in 3 is equal to 2 to the 16, right? I'm basically saying out of all of the 2 to the 16 ways of coloring, I'm going to say that some of those 2 to the 16 go in there. 
some of the 2 to the 16 go in the green one, and some of the 2 to the 16 go in the yellow one. And after I'm done with knowing how big is 1, how big is 2, and how big is 3, the answer is going to be where I divide some of these. And by the way, I want to give an explanation of why. Because you see I have this. This is a picture that goes in category 2. And I'm going to color these green to indicate that this goes in category 2. This one goes in category 2. But by the way, there is another one that goes in category 2 also. The other one that goes in category 2... Oops. What just happened? Yeah, I erased too much. The other one that goes in category 2 is this one. So this one and the other one I just saw, they are each counted once in category 2. I should have used green for that. Each of these is counted once in the green category. Right? This one is counted once, and that one is counted once. However, if I look at the answer, although the green category counts it twice, I actually, in my answer, should only count that once. So the claim is that the answer to the whole problem, after I figure out how big is 1, 2, and 3, the answer is equal to, I will take 1, because all of them are different, plus 2, but divided by 2, and then plus 3, divided by 4. Did this make sense to people? The point of this is to say, you see, if I have something where... Wait, 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 wait. No, 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 I have it backwards, I have it backwards. I have it backwards. It's not this way. It's 1 divided by 4. 1 divided by 4, because all of those rotations appear, right? So when I, when I have the things that are counted in 1, here is one that's counted in just 1. That's counted once in the 1. But there's another one, which is over here, which is also counted in the 1. But by the way, those are like the same as each other up to turning. Okay? So I want to take the 1 divided by 4 plus the 2 divided by 2 and then plus the 3. Well, divided by 1, really. But divide by 1 is just taking the whole 3. And the way to think of this is that, look, if I have something where all four rotations are the same, it's like, let's do another one where all four rotations are the same. could look like this. Right? That's, that's something. That's one way of coloring. But if I colored it that way, of course I should count that once. That's like one thing which is, there's nothing else like it. That's, there's no other picture like it. So that's why whenever I have something in the yellow category, I'll be like, just count that one. Okay? So, in this case, I now need to know how big is 1, how big is 2, and how big is 3. Hmm. What's the easiest way to do this? Take another sip of water. The way I would actually think of doing this is I'm going to make um, something that looks sort of like a Venn diagram. You see, you're the most special if you're in category 3. 3 is like the most special. There's the fewest of those. So there's something here which is, I'm going to call it, these are category 3. I'm trying to draw some Venn diagram-ish thing. That's category 3. Now what's the next most nice thing? It's that if it's category 2. So now I'll draw a picture that looks like this, 2, okay? And then finally, I have all four rotations which are different. That's category 1. What I mean by this is that uh, if I imagine that I had all these pictures, see this picture right here, this beautiful one? I would chuck this picture into the blob which says 3. So I'm just going to go and take all of these 2 to the power 16 pictures, there's 2 to the power 16 pictures, that are somehow inside this like fried egg picture, right? And then I will go and put each of these drawings in the appropriate place. Like this drawing would actually go into this place. Importantly, one is, the, is not, the, I drew the one outside here. This, these are all like different. It's almost like the scores of the dartboard. You know what I mean? It's like if you throw darts and you land it in the middle of the three, you get three points. If you throw darts and you land in the middle of the two, you get two points. If you throw darts and land in the middle of the one, you get one point or something like that, right? So I have all of these darts that I can throw, and the important thing is that the sum total of this whole fried egg picture, the total is 2 to the power 16. Now why am I doing that? 
I'm doing that because I'm about to go and work from the inside out. So the first thing I need to know is how many of the pictures are there where of the four rotations, all four are the same. Now, how would I do that? This I can actually do in a relatively nice way. For example, here's one picture where all four rotations are the same, and it goes inside there. That's one picture. But how many are there? Here's how to think of it. Let's pretend that what's going on is that these guys are copycats. All they do is copy. That's supposed to say copy, like copy and turn. So what I mean is, hey, take any way you want of choosing some of these to be white. Any way that you want. Hey, how about this way? That looks pretty. If I did that, now, if I want to know how many ways can I draw a picture where of the four rotations all are the same, that's easy. I just take this and I copycat it. I ro rotate, 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 and don't break the wrist. But as you rotate all the way around, that makes you one picture. What I'm trying to say is the number of ways to do the number three is equal to how many ways can you do the top right corner. Two to the fourth ways says cold, crazy logic. That's an interesting name you've got there, right? Like no matter how you do the top right corner, do it and have the other guys copy you. And if they all copy you, that will give you a picture where of the four rotations all are the same. That's it. So the number of things, number of ways inside the middle of the fried egg, actually this is not quite a fried egg. A fried egg has like the yellow thing in the middle and then something around it. This is like a fried egg on a plate in the sense that the very boring empty plate which you don't get to eat is the, is the one. Okay? But the, the, the yolk on the fried egg, that's a two to the fourth many things. I'm running out of space. I'm going to use the next screen, but we'll keep flipping back and forth. Okay? And we'll remember the inside of the fried egg. Wow, nice pictures. So the inside is here, and then there's a yellow. Sorry, yellow, and then a green. Is it yellow and then green? Yes, it is. And then you have this plate. The, the boring part, okay? But we know that the inside, there's two to the fourth things inside here. And that happens to be 16. So there are 16 ways to go and make something so that if I go and turn, if I go and turn all four times, it's the same. Now, why did I do that? And why did I draw this Venn diagram thing in this way? It's because what does it mean to be inside both two and, uh, sorry, what does it mean to be inside this thing where you're either in two or in three? This is called being in the egg at all whether you're in the yolk or whether you're in the egg white. The two or the three means that, okay, what does it mean? It means either all the rotations are the same or of the four rotations, they are alternatingly different. This is actually nice. The way I can say this is, cut that out, cut that out, and tell everybody to copy. Not everybody to copy, I mean do one copy. What do I mean? What I mean is that if I happen to draw a picture like this, if I draw a picture like this, then it's true that if I just make that thing a copy, right? I, I, take, the, I take the right hand side, do anything I want, and then I make a copy over on that side. Actually, the way to make the copy, I have to make the copy upside down, right? That's really what's going on. So how do you write copy upside down? I don't know. The easiest way would have been for me to stand upside down, but let's pretend that this is sort of okay. Okay, so this is like copy, right? So what happens is that you get this thing and you copy it upside down over there. And no matter what you do on the right-hand side, if you do something and then just copy over there, I claim you either get into the two or you get into the three. Of course you do. And the reason is because, look, sometimes you get only into the two. That's what I have here. In this picture I drew here, I do that copy thing and I get into the two. But if I just got lucky, if for whatever reason I had tons of luck and I happened to do this on the right, no, that's the wrong one. If I happened to do this on the right, if I did this on the right and I did a copy, then ooh, it would actually go all the way into category three. So what I'm saying here is that somehow if I do anything I want on the right hand side and then just copy, then I'll either drop into the two or I'll drop into the three. Okay, so how many ways are there to do anything that I want on the right-hand side? That's 2 to the power 8, because I have 8 squares. Okay, 
So the number of ways I can do anything I want on the right and then you know, copy it onto the other side, that will drop into the two or the three. And everything that's in the two or the three is, ob is obtained by do something on the right and then do a flip. So what I just found out is that the two and three together, this part all together, this is two to the power eight, which is 256. But remember, that's it all together, including the inside. So if that's including the inside, then how much is on the outside of the egg white it's 256 minus the 16, which is 240. So the important thing of what we just did here is we said, in certain cases, we have a drawing, and all four of the rotations, they're all the same. That's really lucky. You get that when you just so happen to have had something you did here and copied it four times, copied it three times. The other kind is like moderately lucky, and you go and take this and you copy it on the other side. Now, let's go and finish this off. Oh, wait, I know the whole number. 2 to the power of 16. That's how big the whole thing is. So 1, 2, 3, everything combined is 2 to the 16. If that's the case, this whole thing together is 2 to the power of 16, which is 6, 5, 5, 3, 6. In that case, how big is this part, which is the plate? The plate is then 6, 5, 5, 3, 6, minus the 256, minus the 256 because that was this part right here, okay? Right, so this entire green plus yellow was 256, and the whole thing here was 65536 because that was just the number of ways to do anything I want. Oh, you asked, how did I do 2 to the 16 so fast? Honestly, the reason is because I program computers, and 2 to the 16 is very important. And for some of you who know that I've been doing something with an app to stop the spread of COVID-19, actually, the, uh, the heart of what we do is to analyze what's called ultrasound, and we use what's called 16-bit audio in order to analyze ultrasound. 16-bit audio is where you can have up to 65,536 different values for your audio amplitude. So that's actually why that number is just like in my head. Anyway, let's subtract. 6 minus 6 is 0. Uh, 13 minus 5 is 8. This is the hard part. I usually make a mistake here. 4 minus 2 is 2. Oh, that's why people are writing 65280. I thought you were telling me 65280 was 2 to the 16. Okay, but now we're almost done. What are we supposed to do with these three numbers? We're supposed to take number 1 divided by 4, and then take this guy divided by 2, and then add that thing just divided by 1. Let's divide by 4. Hmm, do I have enough space? I think so. I need to do 6, 5, 2, 8, 0, oh, divide 4. 4 times 1 is 4. Okay, now I got 25. Six, 4 times 6 is 24. That's good because 16, 384. That's good because 16, 384 happens to be um, 2 to the power whatever. Like, oh, this is hard. 2 to the power 12 or something? Okay, let's keep going. So now subtract, and you get, what is it next? 12? Okay, 4 times 3 is 12. Ooh, cancels out. And then 8, so 4 times 2 is 8. Subtract, and there's a 0. 16, 3, 2, 0. Do I believe that? Hmm, hopefully people can help me double check. It's entirely possible that I make mistakes when I do this division. So let's see, 16, uh, 12, yeah, it seems reasonable. Okay, 16, two, uh, 16, 3, 2, 0. Next thing is I need to add 240 divided by 2. Remember what I have to do here. This guy has to divide 4. This guy has to divide 2. And the other one doesn't have to divide. So it's time to combine all our numbers. 16, 3, 2, 0. Plus 120, that's 240, divided by 2. Plus 16. And we get an answer, which is 6, 5, 4, 1, 5. 4, 6, 1. So I would go and say, it looks to me like this might be the answer. Oh no, it's the wrong answer. So it's the wrong answer. So in that case, <laughs> so in that case, it looks like people have given me a banana. So this is the wrong answer. So, so in that case, there's a mistake. So whenever we have this mistake, let's go and try to figure this out. Okay, so in that case, that's the wrong answer. So people have seen that, indeed, sometimes these are wrong. So let's see. Let's take a look at this closely and see what just happened when we, when we did this analysis. Did I add wrong? If that's the case, that would be the easiest. But 
if I didn't just, doesn't look like I added wrong. So let's go and look at this more carefully, each of the, li each of the little pieces, okay? So, so when we're looking at this problem, we say Sam is coloring each tile 4 by 4 white or black. Okay, read the problem again. Always read the problem again. I counted the symmetric ones, is that right? Oh! Wait a second. How many rotationally? I'm trying to read the question to make sure that I understand what the question is saying. Two, it could be that we misunderstood the question. So two colorings are called rotationally distinct if neither can be rotated to match the other. Okay, that's right. And how many rotationally distinct ways are there to color the grid so that the colors are not rotationally symmetric. Oh, 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 oh. So actually, I misunderstood the question. The question actually doesn't want to count the ones that are rotationally symmetric. Oh my gosh, the question is so much easier. Wait a second. So now my, so reading the question again. So, so actually, when I read the question at first, I thought that what we were supposed to do is just to find out all of the different ways that I could color where I throw away the ones which are like symmetrical to each other. But that's actually not what we want to do. The question is asking, we need that the coloring is not symmetric. So that means we just want to know the thing in one. We just want to know one divided by four. So actually, all we need to do is the one divided by four. So actually, this answer is a more sophisticated one. This is the thing you do if you're doing something in combinatorics, which is like counting all of the different colorings, where I, don't, where I just want to say I don't count any one more than once. That's what's going on. Okay? So in that case, what we have here is that we have to not do the other two pieces. This, is, this, this answer to the question would have been the answer to a different question. So we have to take that away because we want to throw away the ones that are not rotationally symmetric. But to do 1 divided by 4, we still have to look here. It's the 65280 divided by 4. So in that case, if that's the case, I'm going to revise the answer, and I'll not use that circle. Instead, I'll use the circle, which is the 65280 divided by 4. And let's try this one instead. So second try, let me now ask my assistant, how are we doing here? Is this actually the correct answer? Oh, and it's good. So that's actually what's going on. So thank you very much, for everyone, for putting up with the fact that I read the problem wrong. And indeed, I think I didn't actually need to eat the banana that time. But, you know, well, why not? I guess it doesn't hurt to go and get a little bit more energy. Right. So, you know, while I'm eating this banana, I can go and help answer some more questions. But as you can see here, um, the answer to the question of does Potion Low make mistakes on YouTube live stream? Oh yeah, of course, I do. I mean, one, one thing here is that somehow on, on the YouTube live stream or on this problem in general, one of the biggest things is to make sure you read the problem right. I was fairly, I was fairly convinced that somehow all of these calculations were good. So as soon as my assistant told me the answer is wrong, I was like, whoa, what's wrong? The two most likely outcomes are that I made an arithmetic mistake or that I read the problem wrong. So the first thing I did is I checked the arithmetic and I also saw everyone here in the chat and people were like, arithmetic seems fine. And so that's when it became like, oh, maybe I solved a different problem. All right, so now let's use the rest of the time that we have today, which is only about six minutes to answer random questions because that's actually what we usually do on this live stream. For anyone who came here, uh, you know that what usually happens on this live stream is not that I just go and eat a banana. So what do we have here? What kind of questions? Feel free to ask the questions. I'll try to answer them while eating at the same time. Right. So I see that somebody asked, do you know Sal Khan? So that one, I actually don't know him. Um, somehow we work in slightly different areas in the sense that what I've been doing is I've been doing a lot of this work, which is on this, I guess I would call it math competition type mathematics. And somehow we haven't overlapped on that. More questions. Hmm. Hmm. Lead random. I'm going to put this down and finish it later because I want to make sure I can answer your questions as clearly as possible. Will you stream on Twitch? That's a pretty good idea. I somehow thought about that, but I'm not entirely sure I would use that because it seems like a lot more people seem to use YouTube. And also the YouTube latency is not bad. Like I can put this out and I can see all of you guys talking and answer pretty quickly. I see people are talking about Evan Chen Twitch. 
So I didn't realize that Evan Chen streams his math classes on Twitch. Um, neat. More questions. Hmm. YJY asked, how old were you when you did USA JMO and USAMO? Well, I never qualified for the USA JMO. Well, okay, so the USA JMO was something which was introduced, I don't remember when. I actually don't remember when it was. I don't remember when the USA JMO was introduced. It was like 2000 something. Um, but when I, was, when I was doing all these contests before, there was actually only a, con the, the way it worked is there was no AMC either. It was called the AHSME, which we pronounced as the ASME. And then you do the ASME. There was no ASME 10 or ASME 12. There was just the ASME. And then after that, you would do the AIME. And after doing the AIME, you would go straight into the USAMO. And so the year that, you know, the year that I did this, I, I, I think I was, in, I was in ninth grade. But back then, that's not a huge deal. It's like most people just didn't even know these things existed anyway. Okay, YJY, OMG, he answered. Well, I'm happy to answer some questions out here. More questions. Hmm. Oh, Rithik says USA JMO was in 2010. Really? I didn't realize it was that new. Ah, so I see that Ira has asked, do you do the JHMMC? Well, I go every year uh, to go, well, okay, I try to go every year to go and give a talk or to maybe support the event. And hopefully, whenever the world comes back to normal, you know, maybe I'll be able to go there too. More questions. Hmm. Oh, Nathan Yap asked, did you use Apostle book at Caltech? Well, of course, there was this guy named Apostle, A-P-O-S-T-O-L, Tom Apostle, a famous professor who wrote an amazing set of books on teaching the theoretical foundations of calculus, linear algebra, of one variable and multiple variables. And yes, people at Caltech use that for a class that's called Math 1. That's correct. After you finished your AP Calculus BC exam and you maybe took even some classes at your university, if you go to Caltech, Caltech will say, you are ready for Math 1. And even if you have taken crazy physics classes, they'll say, you're ready for Physics 1. Um, but, you know, these actually build a really good foundation. All right. More questions. Yes, uh, I see that uh, Life with Rainbow has asked, have you created math problems for contests? Yes, I have. Um, occasionally, I have to be involved in helping to set a contest, and I, uh, during that time, I would be the one who would just make the question up if we don't have a good question to put. But nowadays, I think I spend most of my time, you know, really making a very careful question for the teaching purposes. I don't really enjoy just making questions for contest purposes. Okay, which contests? Oh, yes. So the contests that I was making questions for were the UN United States team selection tests. Um, there was a certain time, uh, maybe about seven years ago, when I was the one who was responsible for making sure that the U.S. national team had some selection tests during the year. And during that time, I would often choose some questions to put into here. Oh, <laughs> I see. Yes, uh, Rohan has said that on the JHMMC, uh, the um, Joel Holbrook uh, Memorial Math Competition, it says that I'm a sponsor. Um, yes, I actually do run a line of online math courses, a daily challenge with Po Shen Lo. And what we like to do is we like to be able to then sponsor math competitions all around the country. Hmm. More questions. What else do we have here? Oh, Susan Xu has asked, why are all the blurple hex codes, hex, hex codes of XP, Novid, and Daily Challenge all slightly different? That's probably a mistake. I like how you have called our color blurple. Um, it is both blue and purple at the same time. Very well said. Actually, I like that word. Maybe we'll start calling it blurple. Sounds much better than blue. Anyway, so, so we, yes, we have these blurple logos. And... Uh, they're supposed to all be about the same shades. Maybe we need to coordinate them. All right. Hmm. Okay. I see somebody talking about how to explain. How do you learn how to explain good? How do you explain how to learn how to explain well and quickly? I think the way to learn that is to spend a lot of time caring about other people learning something. And for me, I got that when I was a student. I thought it was a lot of fun to not just solve problems, but I thought that the talking about them afterwards was the fun part. You know, like in a math contest, what usually happens is they say, pencils down, and then the room just erupts in this like, what'd you do, how'd you do this? I always thought that was fun. And so, you know, I, I, I guess it started from there. And I always thought that, you know, just solving the problem, it's not that great. But if you can also solve it and have an interesting way that lets other people see right away how to do it, that was fun. All right.
So unfortunately, today's live stream comes to an end. Uh, I, I welcome all of you who came in from uh, the MBMT. I hope that you got something of what you were hoping for. Uh, you even got to see that I make mistakes, you know, <laughs> I, I make mistakes like everyone else. Um, also, you now know that the secret, if you need more energy, is to eat a banana. And so, uh, if any of you continue to come here, we actually have my banana flopped. Any, we, we always happen to have our live stream every single day, 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. And we'll be doing this for a while, as long as we have a lot of people who are continuing to come. And for those of you who have been here before, thank you for being our loyal, uh, loyal, loyal followers or loyal watchers. I hope that you enjoyed today's problem. Hopefully it wasn't too difficult. But I'll see you tomorrow. Take care. <laughs>